Hello and welcome to Muse Jam Session Recording 166. My name is Danny Beaumont and I'm a Principal Product Manager on the Adobe Muse team. I am joined today by two of my colleagues, Margie from our engineering team, our developer team, and Vadim as well, one of our engineering managers. So with that, we will go ahead and get started. If you've not done so, answering the polling questions on the right is immensely helpful um, so that we have a sense of who's attending today. Looks like most folks have a pretty good sense of Muse and how it works. Um, we will uh, f cover some of the basic attributes of in-browser editing today as well as the more advanced stuff. Um, the good part about our session is it's a, the reason for the dueling banjos and the jam session is that you get to set the agenda to a large extent today as well. So if you have specific questions on in-browser editing that you want to make sure I cover in the presentation, the question presenter pod in the lower right is a great place to log those questions. The coffee was pretty good. It was a little strong because I made it myself, but it was pretty good. Um, if you just want to ask general support questions or technical questions about anything in the Muse application, Margie and Vadim will help watch that chat pod for me and uh, keep an eye on those answers. So absolutely good there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. What you'll notice on the right hand side is, um, and I'm going to actually do something here. Hmm may or may not work well but what you'll notice on the right hand on the left hand side at this point is a resources pod um, that has some links to bits and bytes of content that we have available if you're watching this on youtube you can't click on these links but you probably could screen capture <laughs> and grab the links they're not um, the most complex links but this is material that's out there if you're new to in browser editing um, for you to work with so I'm going to go ahead and share up my screen, and we will take it away. OK. So to begin with, let's talk about the things I usually tend to begin with, which is help and support that's available for you um, for the application. So there's two good places to go for help and support with Muse. The first is the products page on adobe.com. So um, in that Muse area, there is, as soon as this loads up for me, there is a learn and support section, um, Creative Cloud CC Learn, basically. The interwebs, when the Adobe website's a little slow, I know I have trouble today. Um, so on the Muse page, there is a learn and support tab. And it's a great place to get help and support content. If you sh click on the show all tutorials, there's a pretty broad potty, broad, <laughs> what was I going to say? A broad body of information um, here from folks in the community as well as the Muse team that talk about all the capabilities. So good place to go if you're not familiar with it. Um, the other is uh, muse.adobe.com. This is from early days of Muse. We used to use Muse to show this website and show how to build a website. Um, in it, there are the recordings that you're watching. There are links to those past recordings. We're on a YouTube channel now, so all of those recordings can be watched on an iPad if you want to look at it later instead of watching it live and such. Um, we also have under the tutorial section some articles and such that relate to in-browser editing. So you'll notice that we improved in-browser editing in our June release um, to support hyperlinks. And there is a quick video that shows that off and a more in-depth article. And this is one of the articles I had in that sidebar. But this will take you through everything around in-browser editing. Um, for a time, initially when we delivered in-browser editing, it was tied to our hosting platform, that being um, Business Catalyst the hosting that Adobe offers. We went ahead and extended that to in-browser editing anywhere, basically, for any FTP third-party hosting platform um, a while ago uh, with, um, I have to stop umming, with over 12 updates to Muse in the last three years. It's kind of all a blur. But there is availability for in-browser editing on any of those hosting platforms. And basically, the way the world works, let's go ahead and maybe take that from scratch. But before I do, I'm going to show you one more other thing. I'll go ahead and put this into the chat pod, too, to make sure that you have it available. 
Um, and this is kind of an interesting video. I'd love some feedback on it if anyone has looked at it or seen it. But this is an in-browser editing video for your customer. So ordinarily when we develop videos, they're really f geared towards Muse designers and teaching you how to use the application. We specifically wanted this one to be about how to um, use the application as though you were a site owner. So in this example, I'm Katie of Katie's Cafe. My web designer has published the site up, and I'm coming in to edit it. I'll be honest, in everything I've heard from designers that work with people using in-browser editing, the way to make this really impactful is if you have a client, let's say it is Katie, and you've built out the site, and you want Katie and her staff to understand how to use in-browser editing, I'd encourage you to record your own screen recording using the demo asset, the actual website that you've created for your client. It's a little hard for these small business owners to necessarily extrapolate how you would edit Katie's Cafe and how that applies to their own website. It's a great way for you to actually showcase things like images you may have preloaded to the site to allow them to swap out images on the fly and such. So um, doing your own recording or documentation I think makes a lot of sense as you're working. Um, but this one's a good example if it's all you got. It's a good example to give to your client or to use as a model for what you might do in your own recording. If you've gone in and documented in browser editing for your clients, I'd love to see examples of it or hear about it if you're up for sharing that. So you can um, always send mail to Danny, D-A-N-I, at adobe.com. Um, Don't spam me, but uh, it's always good to hear that feedback. All right, so with that said, let's just talk about the basic workflow. I am in the Adobe Muse application, as usual, and I'm using good old uh, Ike's Bikes in this example. So we've moved on from Katie's in the last year to a different demo asset. And in the site, without really working specifically to support in browser editing, I've just designed up the site. Now there are attributes about what can and can't be handled or edited in in-browser editing. And a great way to sort of get your arms around that idea is in the tutorial. So if I come in to muse.adobe.com, the tutorial section here, and I go to this in-browser editing article, so the editing hyperlinks using in-browser editing, if I click on that article link, it will take me to the link um, for the full tutorial for this site. Another great way, I do want to point this out, is if you're in the Muse application, um, you we have in-app help that's specifically in context. When you publish this site up, there will be a link that explains that you can work within browser editing, and next to that link is a question mark. That's going to also lead you to the same tutorial. One of the best parts about the help system that we work with is we support over 18 languages for Adobe Muse. And if English is not your native language, when you click on this link, it will look to your operating system and it'll redirect you to a translated version of this article. So if that's helpful, um, it definitely, uh, if you'd like to read it in your native language, which may not be English, um, this article is likely translated there if it's one of the 18 languages we support. But as you peruse through here, we'll talk a little bit about the different types of imaging and how you can edit those images. Um, I'm going to step through it, but if you want a thorough list of all the ways that you can work with these pieces within a site, it's a great place to come. So here I am in my design, and I've gone in, and I have a variety of elements. Let's just kind of showcase this so we're familiar with the source pretty quickly. For my master site, for my master page, um, I do have some elements that reoccur across the site. So I've got a logo here, I've got navigation at the top, phone number and such, I've got some images here, I've got an SVG graphic down here below and some text. Now these elements reoccur across many if not all the pages in my design, so you'll notice that I've applied that master across these pages. Um, another interesting thing to look at is it's possible to use something known as synchronized text. So just to illustrate it in this asset, I've gone in and defined certain regions that reoccur not only on my desktop design, but my phone layout. So if I come to my site plan again here, notice that I have a phone design. And in the phone design, there are some elements. Let's see, that's kind of interesting. What are we doing here? 
Hmm. That's really funny. That little bike sitting there on its own. Let's try this again on the About page. That is a funny view I've never seen on a page before. That's my phone view with a bike. Um, oh, there it all is. <laughs> Maybe I should get rid of this little bit of a bike and try that again. So here's my phone layout. Um, and in it, you'll notice I have these synchronized text elements. The idea with synchronized text is it allows you to have different um, layouts between your two alternate layouts. And if you make an edit, that edit will propagate to the other layout. So you don't have to remember to um, keep track of that. So let's say I'm coming in here and it says Ike Muddy is a lover of all things cycling. Just within the application, because I define this as a synchronized text element, I can come in and say he's a huge lover of all things cycling. Now I did this by going into the window um, to the content panel. And in it, I've defined collections of elements that are in more than one place in my site. Um, I just want to call this out again when we're looking at the site in the browser and how the behaviors are different. So I've gone in and changed that to say he's a huge lover of all things cycling. And now when I go back to my desktop design, to the About page, if the demo gods are with me, you'll notice it's changed to he's a huge lover. So it allows you to just make changes for shared text across layouts. And that's reflected on the design. So kind of with that said a little bit, I'm going to come in and publish my site. And let's just make sure things are all the way they're supposed to be. So I'm going to go ahead and FTP the content up. Now I could use the publish command, which takes you to the Adobe hosting platform, or I can go to my own third, part, third party hosting platform. In my instance, this is GoDaddy, and go ahead and publish that up. I'll click OK, and I'm going to republish the site. Um, and I'll go ahead and upload those changes. While I'm doing that, I'm going to come back into the chat. There's an article here that um, I've added. Actually, it's a YouTube video, and it's from Joseph Todaro. And it's a nice one. I'm going to just put it into the chat so that it's handy here as well. Um, you can click that link if you're watching this live. But it's a nice article because what Joseph gets into is a little bit about hosting platforms and the back end system that you're using to host your site and setting up FTP accounts for your client. So one of the assumptions is if I'm working with Ike in this example and Ike has staff and the staff wants to update the service agreement or they want to update, they may have a section of bicycle items that, they're, that are on special that week. Um, what we don't want to do is give the entire Ike Spike staff FTP access to the live site. I don't want them to damage the large aspects of the site. So what I did is in my hosting platform, um, which is with GoDaddy, I created an account for people that have access to FTP content to um, my hosting platform, but they're not, sorry, this thing's loading a little slow, they're not um, given full access to really damage the backend hosting of my system. So as I mentioned, once I FTP the content up, we inform you that you can use in browser editing to edit the site in the browser. And here's the question mark that if you click that is going to take you to the tutorial that we showed um, in your appropriate language. But you notice that it's giving you a link here letting you know it can be edited. I can simply go to, um, if you go to inbrowserediting.adobe.com or just inbrowserediting.com, it will redirect to this page. And this page is just going to kind of do a ricochet a little bit. So you're going to enter in the URL of your live site. So in my case, this is Ike's Bike Shop SF. Dot com, and I'll click Start Editing. We do a quick query to see who's hosting that domain, and then we ask you for the appropriate FTP attributes. Now, as I mentioned, I'm not going to log in as Danny here. I don't want to use my main FTP account, although I could. Um, I'm going to log in using, let's say, Ike's Designer. And then I've got a password. These are FTP attributes for that site that I've already set. And then I'll click Sign In. Now what in browser editing does is it's going to load that site into the browser in a way that I can now come in and edit. So I'll go ahead and dismiss this little um, hostile takeover, as they call it. 
And I'm here on the site and it looks just like my main site. I don't see much difference. The only nuance is up here in the top is the Adobe CC and browser editing bar. Now, one of the important things in that bar is if I have multiple alternate layouts, I can jump to any one of those layouts through this drop down. Now, I didn't design a tablet layout, so I'm not going to see that here, but I'm here in that desktop mode. Now, this is where it starts to become important if you look at a list of all the things and how those things can be edited. Now, as I roll over, um, I can see I've got navigation here. And for some reason, it's not allowing me to edit that navigation. The reason for that is that this is a dynamic menu. So if I go back to my Muse application and I go back to my um, site plan, you'll notice that my pages here are all, um, we're going to actually play a game here and do some testing. I'm going to create another create another test page. This is on a live site, so what I'm doing is going to be a little dangerous, but life is short, and I think we have time today. So I'm going to create another page, and I'm going to call it test. And I'm going to go ahead and be smart about this, and I'm going to make sure that it is excluded from the menus, that test page, so it's not going to actually be anything that anyone can navigate to. This is just going to be a little backdoor page that I'd like to play with a little bit as we work. So it's not in the navigation here at the top. Um, but the point that I was making is the reason that that navigation, that menu is not editable is because it is a dynamic menu. What we wouldn't want you doing is coming in and changing the name services to um, help and support um, and have that mess up your site plan, for example. Now, a way that I could create an editable menu would be if I came in, let's just go ahead and see if I can play with this dynamically. If I came into the master page, let's just grab that navigation that I've created. I'm going to copy it. And let's go to our little test page here. And I'm going to paste this guy in. But instead of having it be a dynamic menu, one generated dynamically based on the site content, I'm going to go ahead and select manual. It's going to inherit the styling of what I had there. But let's just come in and play here for a second. So I'm going to come in and call this home. And I'll go ahead and add um, a couple more items. We'll call this about. Now, the question you always want to ask yourself is why? <laughs> so in browser editing, I've actually worked on this technology. It was called in-context editing. We delivered it with uh, Dreamweaver probably nine years ago, eight years ago at this point. And um, I've talked to a lot of customers about what designers want and what small business owners want in the way of editability for a site. And we are constantly trying to really examine that and think about what the real use cases are. So I'm showing you, for example, that you can make a menu that's changeable. But what I think you want to constantly ask yourself is why. <laughs> is it better for you to make this change for your client? If the giant client were able to do this, what is their goal? What are they after? And is this the best way for them to do it? I'm going to show you how to do it. It's up to you to decide when and where you enable this stuff. So, so I've got my own little mini menu here. And what you'll notice is, although it's a manual menu, I can decide to point it to those same pages. So I'm clicking on the About menu item and selecting the About page. So these pages will navigate to the appropriate pages. So it's, in essence, simulating that same kind of menu as I have above. But the difference is that this will be editable in in-browser editable in editing, and this one will not be. Let's kind of keep going along these lines a little bit. I'm going to go back to the website. You'll notice that although I cannot, I cannot edit the navigation here, the menu, I can actually click and interact with these elements. I have another element here, which is the Ike's Bike Shop. This is a placed SVG graphic. It is not acting editable. And if I come back and take a look at that, let's just see for a moment how that guy is set up. Now, in general, this looks like it's just a placed SVG object. If, again, we're going to have a play date here, and hopefully this is more interesting than just a slick demo. Um, let's bring our test page down here so we can see it a little more easily. Um, if I were to work with a few different graphics, I'm going to come in and grab some Ike's graphics here. Let's get a nice image. Um, we'll go ahead and grab this saddle. So I'm going to press and drag the saddle. I'm just placing it on the canvas. Another way I might do it 
is if I come in and create a container, and I'm going to come fill the container with that same saddle. And let's go ahead and scale it to fit, and we'll center it. Now, in order to keep ourselves from going too crazy here, um, let's do this. I'm going to steal some text because I wouldn't want to bother styling it out myself. We're going to call this placed. And we're going to call this one uh, filled container. Okay. And um, let's see. I'm thinking to myself, let's go ahead and publish it up. No harm in that. We hope. So I'm going to push up these pages that we're playing with a little bit. Uh, and while that is publishing, we can come back into the browser, see where things are. So as I explained, I've got navigation that's up here. It's not editable. Um, there are also elements that are on the master page. And part of me, I'm going to look for a second and see. Bear with me. Who we got in our crowd here? Okay. All right, I'm going to keep going. Notice I can come in and edit the text that's here. This is just straight up text. I can edit it by clicking on that edit button there. Let's see if Muse is done with its magic. Just about done. We're going to keep going, and then I'm going to refresh the page. So what you'll notice is I can tell when an object is editable by rolling over that object, and the Edit button comes up with that object. If I scroll down to some of the other objects, you'll notice I have a text container here, text container here. They're all editable. I've got graphic elements. So notice that there's a difference here. Um, this is a graphic element. This entire object has had a hyperlink applied to it. I can see what that link is, so it's taking you to the services.html page, so a sub page of the site. I have the ability to edit the link or follow the link. And the little icon indicator here is letting you know that will allow you to follow and that will allow you to edit. Let's see if, um, all right, now we're done. I should be able to come on in here. Let's just refresh the page in in browser editing. I may need to log in again, but let's see if it wants to be nice to me. Okay, so I'm just refreshing the page. And we know that we did that on test. So I'm going to go ahead and type in test.php. Hmm. Let's see, I might have done bad things. Let's try HTML. All right, there's the test page. And as we mentioned, just kind of breaking things down into pieces. I still roll over the nav. I can navigate, but I can't edit. But in this instance of the nav, notice as I roll over each object, I both can see where it's pointing, which URL it's pointing to, which page. And I can come in and edit it. So I can either follow it. If I click it, it's going to take me to the products page. If I click here, it's going to come in and allow me to make an edit. So notice I can edit the contents. I may decide to ch call, uh, call this our stuff. And I'll click Update. It's now changing that. And you'll notice that we're doing a nice job of the change. We're inheriting the styling that is applied to that object. Now there's some tricks for how to keep a hold of styling. And I'm going to show you that. Um, I had that option here to either navigate, edit, or actually edit the link. Now interestingly enough, I can come in here and point to any other page. So let's just show that again a little bit more slowly. So when I come to anything with a hyperlink, I can see, guess what? It's going to go to about.html in that subdirectory. Um, my other option is to navigate or edit it. Um, notice here, I can also change where that link goes. So when I click on edit link, um, we applied hyperlinks uh, in the last release, I believe it was June, and it was actually a lot more complicated than I ever thought it would be. So when you define a hyperlink or something you link to, 
there are many different things that you can link to. There are particular pages. So in this menu here on the left, it says pages. Now I could link to any known page in the site. I can even link, link to specific anchor tags within a page. Um, I can also link to anything external. Now, if you experiment with hyperlinks, I've pushed the envelope a little bit um, on how much you can put into a hyperlink. You can select something like an, uh, an email. So notice here you can go to an email address. That would be mail to if you were in Muse. And it allows you to mail to danny at adobe.com, for example. Um, in this external area, if you like to put extended content in your hyperlinks, you can continue to do that. You can say send an email message, title it, um, something in particular, and even start the body copy of that email with particular text. And that's something you can add into your um, hyperlink text here. But we're helping out a little bit because the point of this is really small business owners. So Ike has a bunch of kids working in his repair shop. And if they were allowed to come in and make edits, they don't necessarily know lots about the web the way you would. And you don't want them calling you up or breaking the site. So we're helping them out a little bit more. They can define a phone number. They can define an SMS if they wanted a text to occur. Um, they can actually go and browse for a file. And this is kind of interesting to see how far you might push this. Let's even come in for a second and pretend that I just want to make a list of downloadable files here. I'm going to come in and edit it and I've got the word placed. Notice there's a link icon here. I may come in and say um, today's special. And in the link area here, I may want to come in and insert a link. And for that link, I could go browse to a file. Let's see if I can find something that happens to be of the PDF nature that's safe. <laughs> Funny that. Um, Anything here? All right. Hmm. Oh, we'll just find some innocent Adobe employee purchase PDF file for some Adobe software. OK. So um, this is a PDF file. I just browsed for it. Um, maybe we'll pick something else. Let's just see. It's bound to be something safe. Because I know you people, you're going to go download the file. OK, let's learn to row. <laughs> That's pretty safe, in case you like rowing. Um, OK, let's see. So uh, we've got row for San Francisco Flyer. And what I'm doing is browsing to a file. I'm going to go ahead and insert the link. And what's happening, I'm actually going to come check with you guys, because I want to make sure everything is good. Hi. <laughs> Something tells me you'd like me to start sharing my screen. <laughs> oh, let's see, we've missed a lot. <clears throat> the good news is the recording will skip the painful part, but I'm back. Let me, in summary, review a little bit of what we've done that you couldn't even see. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's amazing how often your phone rings during a jam session when it's really meant for you to pick up. So what I've done while you were gone, let's take this from the top. Nice, clean recording. So what I want to do is, in Muse, uh, come in and make some editable elements. So on my test page, I have a few things. I've gone in and created a manual menu. And this, if you notice in the flyout, it's set to manual instead of top level pages. What it will not do is dynamically list all of the pages on the site. But what it will do is by manually defining my menu, it will be editable and in browser editing. So I've gone in and simulated these first three elements, home, about, and products. Um, I also have some images. I have a placed image. And I also have a container that's been filled with that image. So two different approaches to really represent the same image. And I've got some words here, placed and filled. OK? So what I've done is gone in and published that up to the web. And let's go back into in-browser editing and take a look at some of this. So if I come into inbrowserediting.com, we're kind of taking things a little from the top. I'm going to go ahead and log into Ike's Bike Shop, sf.com, and with my login credentials, so Ike's Site Designer.
and I'll sign in. You guys are so quiet when you can actually see my screen. It's amazing. Let's see if I can do that correctly. So what Muse is going to do is go to the hosting platform. Oof, get mad at me. Ike's Site Designer. Nothing like live performance. You never know what the demo gods are going to do. Hmm. Let me try my proper doorway here for a second and see if it's happier. Might have forgotten my credentials. Okay, so I'm logging in. Um, as I mentioned, it's not my usual FTP attributes. It's a second FTP login I created for editors to be able to use. Um, here I am in my in-browser editing heading area. I can navigate between alternate layouts. Um, I'd like to go directly to that test page that we built. So I'm going to go to test that HTML. And it's going to navigate to that page. Now this is just a silly little test page, and I'd encourage you, if you're wanting to understand how your site will work, to go ahead and do this. Play a little bit, because interestingly enough, you are tech support for this small business owner. Um, it pretty much will fall on your shoulders. So what you'll notice is, as I roll over here, the logo is not editable. My navigation up here at the top is not. Looks like my page is still loading, so we'll give it a second longer. OK, so I can roll over the navigation here and navigate, but I cannot edit. Whereas the manual menu that I defined, I can come in and edit. So as I roll over it, it's indicating both what the URL is, so about.html, that's pointing to the About page. I manually linked that. I can edit the content or edit the link. So I may want the word About to change. I may say instead, um, us. Nice. When I click Update, it's still going to be pointing to the About page, but I've changed the label. Inversely, if I click on the Link icon, it allows me to link to other things. I feel like we've covered this before, but you couldn't see anything. So if I come to the text here that says Placed, and I decide I want to edit it, you'll notice it has no link on it, but I could come in and add a link. I may come in and say, um, Learn to Row. How about Learn to Bike with Ike. So I've changed the text associated with that. Additionally, I want to link to something. So I can come in and insert a link or unlink something I no longer want to link to. When I'm inserting that link, there are a number of options I have. So anything that has a hyperlink that I either add or has been defined, I can see all of the pages in the site. So the drop downs indicating all of the pages that are there, including anchor tags. I can also link to an external location. And this is where, if you know much about how to build a complex HTML link, you could link to a number of different things. It's kind of an open door. But for your small business owner, the world is pretty safe. They can come in and link to a phone number. They can send an SMS by selecting external and putting SMS in the head. Um, they could link to a file. So you'll notice I was doing this when you guys were doing something else, maybe trying to see my screen. But I went ahead and browsed for a PDF file, and it remembered that. The way I did it was click the Browse to Upload file here, and I'm selecting just a PDF file that's handy, and I'll click Open. Um, it's saying that I've already uploaded it, which is good. It's letting me know it's already there. Um, but I can come in and select that file. You'll notice I can also define tooltips. Tooltips are important for search engine optimization. They're also important for screen readers. If someone is on your site and ha is visually impaired, rolling over this PDF file that um, will say learn to row, rolling over that link, the text, will give them tooltip text that you can indicate what it is that they're looking at. So, I, And I can also select to open in a new window rather than within 
the same web browser. If I go ahead and insert that link, Muse is going to upload, or actually in this case in browser editing, will upload that FTP file and it's now associated with my content. Now notice I did this in somewhat of a messy way. Let's go try to clean it up. I didn't really give a name to it. So let's go in and look at that guy. I'm going to try to give it a tooltip that says learn to row with us and click update. Let's try this. I'm going to grab that file and click insert link. Okay, so now the link is called learn to row. Um, and it has, if I could stop fiddling here. Grab that link one last time. All right, so it's hyperlinked. When I click update, notice it's inheriting the style of that container. We know that you would like more controls over styling. Um, we get that. We are thinking and working with it. The nuance there is not so much exposing in the browser, but if your site owner comes in and makes lots of style changes, um, making sure that any of those changes blow back into the Muse application so that you as a designer aren't clashing with any of those style changes in the browser. But I've made that change. I now have learned to row and I'm linking to that PDF file, but I haven't taken it live yet. If I click on publish, as the site owner here, I'm now making changes. And this could be lots and lots of content. I could continue to add a full list of links in this container if I'd like to. Um, it's now live on the site and that user can continue to come in and edit. So let's look at some of the other pages. If I come into the about page, um, there is a mixed case of text and images. I can edit some of this text. Here's about us, I can edit that. Now let's say we have a mixed styling scenario. I'm kind of liking just doing things in isolation here. I hope this isn't too slow for you guys, but um, I've got some text here and I want to just show mixed styling. So I've got a nice font. It's got a font, a color and such. And let's even come in and cheat a little bit. I'm just going to grab some text because I'm feeling lazy. All right, so I've got some style text here and we'll make it a little larger. Um, I may come in and say that affinity for cycling really needs some emphasis and I'll come in and give it another color. Now this may be a color I'm using in my design. It's just something that will have some color there. So now I have um, that text defined there. Um, let's do something interesting first before we go too much further. I'm going to stop this. I'm going to cut it. And um, as we know, on the site, a change has happened. So Ike has been there messing around with the test page. And I may be working in Muse at the same time, it may be a week later, but it's important as a designer that I don't step all over any of the changes that might have been made in the live instance of the site. So when I open Muse up, every time I do that, it's going to make a quick query to the live published instance of that site and find out if there have been any changes. If there have, it'll alert me, and you've probably seen this saying, hey, you're out of sync with your live instance. Do you want to compare the differences? If I happen to be already in the site, in the file, um, I can pull down on file to sync with web version, and that will force that comparison between what's running locally and what's remote. Um, now, as we know, I did make some changes, and I'm now seeing these changes reflected in the Muse application in the file. So notice I'm in the review and merge changes area here. It's saying, you know what, you changed the word about to be the word us. I see that in green. And it's also hyperlinked. It's giving me an indication of where that link is pointing, which is the about page. I can come in and choose to merge that change. I can look at it. I can say, show me where on the page it is. So the old one was about, the new one is us. If I'm comfortable with that change, I can say, go ahead and merge that change into Muse. We know that learn to row, I changed. So it used to say place. Now, of course, it says learn to row, and it's a hyperlink. 
I can roll over the link to see where it's going to link to. I'm going to go ahead and merge that change into Muse. And it's saying that it's also changing the link to that PDF file. So I'm going to go ahead and click Done. So what I've elegantly done midstream <clears throat> is pulled any differences, any changes from my live site into my design. I can come back now and add this little bit of text. And for good measure, we'll come on in and republish all of this back up. So I'm kind of in an intricate way pushing back and forth content between the live instance of the site and my local instance of the site. Let's go ahead and let that publish up again. I'm going to come into the chat without stopping sharing my screen, by the way, because that doesn't go well. Just check on chat. I get to clear out all the non-questions, which had to do with scaling uh, with um, sharing my screen. Looks like we've got some good explanation. I think Vadim's got things handled. Margie's probably telling me to start sharing my screen. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to go back. Still sharing my screen. <clears throat> and keep things going. So we've republished those pages. And I can come back to in-browser editing. And let's go ahead and repay it, refresh that page. So it's a bit funny because it's not in my navigation. Let's go ahead and go back in and try test. Let's see if I can get back there. All right, <clears throat> so we've looked at a lot of these pieces. We now have a block of text. And the point of this text is mixed styling. It's tricky. It's not pretty. It's hard probably for small business owners to necessarily get this exactly right. But what you'll notice is that I've got the words affinity for cycling using a different color. It could be a different font. It could be spacing. There are styling attributes associated with the text. If I come in to edit here, as long as I click inside that text, so affinity for all things amazing in the world of cycling, and click Update, notice that it's using the styling that is wrapped around that content. So if I had a bold heading and then I had text that's styled here, as long as the editor of the text is staying within the span, the text that's defined here that has the different styling, it's going to inherit that styling. All right, I'm going to go ahead and publish that up just to keep things neat and clean. Let's look a little bit at images at this point. Um, as we know, we have a filled container and we have a placed object. As it stands now, filled containers cannot be edited in an in-browser editing. Now, this is good in that you may choose to not want to let your site owner edit everything that's out there. If you want to make sure they don't muck up the site, you want to allow them to only edit text, placing images in containers can keep them from editing it. The downside, to be honest, is let's pretend you have a 100% width page or object. If we go to another page on the site, let's try about. Um, I have something defined as scale to fill here because I am, it's, it's, it's scaling in the browser. Notice how this image is scaling along. I had to define it as a fill object in order to apply that technique. In doing so, it keeps me from being able to let my site owner edit that block of text. So there's that downside to that behavior. Um, and as I mentioned, in the documentation, we'll talk to you about the pros and cons, how you can come in and make edits on certain objects. We know that um, this is shared text between phone and desktop. So let's kind of take a look at that. If I come in and say, we decided that Ike Muddy was a huge lover of all things cycling. If I jump over to the phone layout, um, also if it's helpful, you can open up two windows in your browser and look at them side by side. So maybe I'll do that on the way back just to save some load time here. But I can look at the phone layout. It's not running on the phone, obviously. So the browser version of this phone page is not going to be um, as pretty as it would be on the phone, but it will allow you to come in and edit that content. Let's just see where we are here. Still loading. The internet gods are playing with us today. 
here we go. So it says Ike is a huge lover. Um, I am going to come on in here. Let's open up another tab. And let's just go back to desktop. You'll notice I'm doing this directly in the navigation. You can do this. Um, in some ways, you have to be careful because sometimes you'll navigate to the wrong page. Um, so for example, I may have gotten it mad over here by directly navigating. Let's go in and probably do things properly. I'll go directly to the front door. Maybe not that much of a front door. All right, that's OK. Stick with this guy. I'll come in and make some changes. So Ike's Muddy is a really huge lover. Really, really huge lover. I click Update. I'm going to go ahead and publish that up. And although I've made the change on the phone layout, if I navigate back to my desktop layout into the About page, depending on timing here, so I go back to that About page, Notice that he's a really, really huge lover. So if you have shared content in your alternate layouts and you define them with the synchronized text feature, um, you'll be able to allow them to come in and make edits on one end and it'll apply to the others. All right, I've eaten up a chunk of time. Sorry about the technical glyph glitch earlier with the screen sharing. Um, but let's see what questions there are out there that I can address. So Vadim and Margie, if something's come up that you think I need to sh cover. Um, let's see. I'm just trying to figure out what you guys are talking about a little bit. Looks like everyone's following along. Any outstanding questions? I'm going to go ahead and switch over, well, I'll end up losing screen share if I switch too quickly. So I'll give it a couple more minutes if there's any outstanding questions. I think that the dialogue with in-browser editing is still ongoing between the development team and people that are using the tool. As I mentioned at the top of the hour, I think as a designer for websites, it helps us if you really think about what small business owners need to be able to do around editing. Um, but if you do join the Muse pre-release, there's a great space where you can um, give us feedback about how you're working with in-browser editing and help us improve the feature. It's definitely something that we're developing in an ongoing way right now. We want to grow its functionality. Um, so join the beta if you do want to give us your two cents about how to improve the feature's capabilities. Um, I've gone to my last section here. Go ahead and let me know what you think of this session. In-browser editing is kind of its own beast, but totally open to um, any recommendations for improving the session. If there's something we didn't cover, let me know. I'm happy to cover it now. We still have a little bit more time. Seamus wants to know if we're giving you a roadmap of things you can see in the future. No, we won't. <laughs> it's the Adobe way, and I think that's for a few reasons. First off is anyone that's in the pre-release um, or in even the forums or just have been using, using Muse over the last few years, I think you would agree that the engineering team, the product team, takes your feature requests very seriously. And we are in an ongoing way continuing to improve the product. We are part of a very large organization, though. And there are things that we want to do for our user base. And there's things that Adobe wants us to do to be part of the Creative Cloud or just a good member of the Adobe portfolio. And that makes feature delivery unpredictable for us around when we'll deliver on capabilities. If you do want to know what's going on, a great place to go, I'll put this in the chat, is musepre-release.com. The good news is that is a private beta space. When you enter the room, you promise to keep the secret secret until you hear us talk about things publicly. But, um, but uh, it's a great way to see what we're working on and what is close to being delivered. There is a new beta. We pushed it out this week. It's got some really cherry, wonderful new capabilities. I encourage you to check it out. More big, big things coming down the pipe. Um, but that is a great way to just know what's going on, see what's coming in the future. Long-term future, we have ideas. Um, but as I mentioned, it's, we would prefer to deliver more than we promise and delight you than disappoint you by saying something's going to happen um, and it gets pushed out six months or a year from the roadmap that we expect. 
So that's why we don't go too forward thinking about it. But I do think that the Muse team is pretty darn open. And in that private beta space, we will um, really engage with you around requests that you have. So Dan's saying, if a client wants to change a picture but doesn't know about image optimization, is there a way to be alerted so that the size change without exporting the site? What happens, Dan, is if they browse for a file, we will subsample it to the appropriate resolution. Um, if they're uploading a high resolution device and you've enabled high DPI on your site, we'll create both the 2x instance and the standard instance. So. Um, we don't have a lot of controls there. There aren't any controls. The user browses for a file. One thing I did not show um, is that you are welcome to, in the Upload Assets window, you can upload 30 images that aren't used anywhere on your Muse site. When the user of in-browser editing goes to change an image, they can select from either something on their own machine, something that's being used in the site, or the 30 images that you uploaded to the assets folder, they'll all be available. So let's say you're working for Ike's Bikes and they want to be able to promote a different special each week and they want to change the image, but you don't trust them to do quality work with photography, which is probably most business owners' um, debacle. They don't necessarily spend time doing image quality improvements when they're selling bicycles. You upload those 30 photos, they can pick from any of the 30 that you've uploaded. They do not need to be on the site in order for you to upload them. Just basically under File, select Upload Assets, and you can upload those with the site. Um, but to answer your question, we will subsample the image um, for you so that it's the appropriate resolution. If they have some 10 megapixel image that they've uploaded from an iPhone, let's say, you don't have to worry. It's going to be a really heavy load for the site. We'll subsample that automatically. Um, so Giacomo is saying, I noticed you can't edit photos in some widgets. Um, that may be true. Depends on which widget you're looking at. Um, there is some editability. Uh, for example, slideshows, I believe you can browse, but you have to upload both the thumbnail image and the main image. Um, composition widgets, I believe you can, but depends on which, like accordions, could be. Again, there's always value to doing a little bit of testing to see what's happening and if there are workarounds. You can reach out to us. That private pre-release forum is a good space to request features. Um, the public forum, there are folks trading um, just tips and tricks for having used it. I'm glad Richard knew what my login was. Thanks for keeping track. <laughs> All right, people, I think we've um, closed this one out. I'm getting ready to uh, put up two more jam sessions over the next four weeks, so keep an eye out on Facebook or the um, events area. I will come back to a link for this session, um, and then we're going to push it up to YouTube without the whole screen sharing missing part to save me the embarrassment, uh, but that will be available later today. So hold on, and I'll be back in just a moment.